Hey everybody, we're back with our sixth episode of the Orthopedic Anatomy series, exploring your body from the inside out. Today we'll be highlighting the foot and ankle for our final episode of season one. I'm Elena Kachan, Marketing Manager at Ortho Carolina, and I'll be your host today alongside Rachel. And I'm Rachel Klaus, Director of Academic Services at Experience Anatomy. If you're tuning into this event series for the first time, we'll give you a little background. At Ortho Carolina, our goal in 2020 was to create a series of events to educate you on your anatomy and explain what actually happens to your muscles, bones, and joints when you're in pain. We set out to highlight a variety of orthopedic topics so you can get all of your questions answered by our team of doctors alongside the experts at Experience Anatomy. For those of you who don't already know Experience Anatomy, we are a premier anatomy education company specializing in training and education using real preserved human specimens. We are fully outfitted with a cadaver lab and human plastinates, which allow you to see what your muscles and bones look like underneath your skin. Here's a quick look at what we do. Welcome to Experience Anatomy, where we're dedicated to providing the highest quality anatomical specimens for all levels of training. This is our classroom and conference center designed for intimate learning, virtual sessions, and larger panel discussions. This is our multifunctional lab space, fully equipped as a mock OR, where we host cadaveric dissection and surgical training. Our lab is the ideal setting for educators, researchers, medical professionals, first responders, and military personnel to develop and hone their skills. We are committed to facilitating cadaveric tissue study using a proprietary soft embalming technique in a rich, authentic, and convenient learning environment. Experience Anatomy, where education meets application. With the changes in our world, this program has been adjusted to be a completely virtual experience, so you can tune in wherever it's convenient for you. The entire video will be available after the event, so if you miss something, you can watch it back later and share with a friend if you find this information helpful. Now, today we'll be discussing the most common foot and ankle ailments that we see. We'll touch on ankle sprains and fractures, bunions, heel pain, Achilles tendonitis, and more. We'll discuss what that means when it comes to your care and what your appointment and potential treatment can actually look like. This is a virtual event streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, so this is your opportunity to ask our foot and ankle doctors anything. We have a panel of five physicians ready to answer your questions at the end. If you already know what you want to ask, comment in our live stream below on whichever platform you're watching and we will be sure to discuss. Now let's meet our panelists. Hey all, thanks so much for joining us today. Why don't you all introduce yourself so we can get to know you, where you typically see patients, any other information you'd like to share about yourselves. So hello, my name is uh, Malik Bashabi. I'm a, an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in uh, foot and ankle pathology. And um, I uh, work and practice in the Concord area. And um, I, I operate uh, just on the outskirts, outskirts of um, Charlotte uh, in Concord, as well as Gateway and Mallard Creek. Hi, my name is Scott Biggerstaff. I'm an orthopedic surgeon that specializes in foot and ankle surgery. Um, I mainly operate and see patients in Winston-Salem and Kernersville. Hey there, I'm Sam Ford. I, I work in um, downtown Charlotte. I'm also an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon. Um, most, most of my surgery is done at Charlotte Surgery Center off of Randolph Road and, and also at CMC Mercy. Hey, my name is Todd Irwin. Um, I'm also a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon at the Foot and Ankle Institute in Charlotte. I also see patients in the Matthews office as well as South Park. Um, and uh, I operate at, at those locations. Uh, we all specialize in a lot of different things, ankle arthritis, deformity, neuromuscular other conditions. There's some of the things I like to do. My name is Scott Sean. I am uh, also an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon, uh, retired army uh, about five years ago. I came back to uh, Charlotte. I work at the Foot and Ankle Institute as well as in Pineville, 
uh, and the Ballantine area as well as Rock Hill. Um, and I operate mainly out of Mercy as well as Matthews Surgery Center. Great. So now that we've met all the panelists, if you have a question, please comment on the live stream below and we'll tackle those at the end. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first segment with Dr. Irwin as he touches on what he sees most in his practice and what your next steps may, might be while moving forward when consulting an orthopedic specialist. My name is Todd Irwin. I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle specialist at Ortho Carolina. I work out of the Foot and Ankle Institute here in downtown Charlotte, as well as the Matthews office and the South Park office. We see all kinds of foot and ankle problems, everything from just below the knee down to the toes. The foot and ankle is actually very complex. The ankle joint itself controls the up and down motion of the foot as it relates to the leg. The other joints below the ankle, there's three other joints that we talk about, including the subtalar joint, really help with the side-to-side -side motion of the foot. That relates to things like uneven ground. And as you go out further into the foot, there's a lot of rigid midfoot joints. Then we get out towards the toes, in particular the big toe joint. One of the more common things we see is arthritis of the big toe joint. Very, very common problem that is important to recognize and, and understand the anatomy and how that relates to their function. If a patient comes in with a chronic condition such as a bunion, they have pain from a bunion, typically starts with a really good history and physical and doing a good thorough examination. And then we typically start with radiographs or x-rays and we like to show the patient what those images show and correlate them with what the physical exam is. So we have to put all those data points together to figure out what the problem is and then come up with a treatment plan after that. An athletic type injury is going to be more of an acute injury that would be more like a sprain or even a, a fracture of the ankle, a lot of pain and swelling right off the bat, versus a chronic wear and tear uh, is gonna be more of a sort of a dull achy pain that could come in the middle of the foot or in the front of the ankle, certainly worse with activity, sometimes first getting up out of bed in the morning, that's more of a wear and tear or, or arthritic type condition. We see arthritis in several different areas around the foot and ankle. Arthritis is really just a loss of cartilage, which leads to bone rubbing on bone. In general, for arthritis, there's a handful of treatment options that we can proceed with. Pretty much for any arthritis, an anti-inflammatory medicine can be very helpful to help with the symptoms. We often start with some type of ankle brace or immobilization. If patients don't respond to simple things like anti-inflammatories, bracing, some other options would be cortisone injections, both to determine where the pain is coming from, as well as to give the patient some relief. If patients aren't responding to, to simple treatments, if it's affecting their ability to do things they like to do, that's when we start talking about possible surgical intervention for the arthritis. A lot of patients come in with pain after a, a small injury, and sometimes we will see sprains, which is really a stretch of a ligament. It could happen in the ankle, it could happen in the midfoot, or even out in the toes. You can sprain the ligaments of, of the joint itself. Versus another injury that is pretty common is a stress fracture. What that is, is more of a acute repetitive stress on a bone itself that can lead to kind of a microscopic fracture. Those are a couple of aspects of, of injuries that may present in a similar fashion and look similar but are, are quite different in terms of the anatomy that is injured. Some of the imaging that we get is an MRI scan versus a CT scan. A CT scan is a more high-powered x-ray for us and it gives us a lot of detail about the bone and the joints and whether or not there are bone spurs or arthritis or sometimes occult or hidden fractures that weren't necessarily seen by the x-ray. 
An MRI scan for us gives us more detail on the soft tissues, which include the ligaments, tendon injury, as well as if there's something going on inside the bone, such as edema or swelling or inflammation inside the bone, which can give us, again, more information about what the true problem is. Edema essentially means swelling, and so if someone has an injury, um, you might have a swollen ankle from an ankle sprain, so that's considered soft tissue edema. But we also see uh, bone edema. You have an injury to a ligament, but the ligament actually pulls off the bone, and you can't see that on an x-ray, but on an MRI, you're going to have some increased signal, so whereas it might look dark, and a normal bone on the MRI, it'll light up and be white. We call that bone edema, which again can indicate inflammation or injury or even arthritis. Bunions are another very common problem that many patients think they need surgery for but don't always need it unless they're having significant pain. There are many different surgical treatment options and it really depends on how severe the bunion is, both on x-ray and how severe their pain is. Orthotics are inserts that are put into shoes to either correct a problem or just treat symptoms. Orthotics can be very helpful, but they should be used to treat specific problems and, and specific symptoms. Many of you might have had an orthotic that's made in the past. We've had some newer technology recently that we use at our office in Winston-Salem. We have a pressure mat and we have the patients walk over the mat for about five minutes. The computer then collects data points and that gets sent off to the orthotic company and then the orthotics are 3D printed based off of that data. If someone does have a very flat foot and that's causing pain on the outside part of the ankle, an arch support built into an orthotic can help offload that area. So we've covered many of the common ailments and complexities of the foot and ankle. We feel very confident at the Ortho Carolina Foot and Ankle Institute that we can treat these and really address any of the problems that you may have. Please reach out to us and make an appointment online and we will get you in for further evaluation. Thank you. That segment was jam-packed with tons of great information. Thank you so much, Dr. Irwin. That was great. I hope you learned something. Um, Rachel, you're the anatomy expert. Is it true that the bones in our feet make up a quarter of the bones in our bodies? I heard that, and I need to know the truth. Well, I guess it is actually technically true, because there are 26 bones in each foot, as well as 33 joints, 19 muscles, 10 tendons, and 107 ligaments. And that makes up 25% of the body's bones. For those of us jo just joining, this is the final orthopedic anatomy series of this year in partnership with Experience Anatomy. If this is your first time tuning in, be sure to check out all of our previous episodes this year featured on our YouTube channel at Ortho Carolina, hopefully where you're watching. So Dr. Bachabi, I'm gonna start with a question for you. Foot pain is so common and not all injuries are acute. When should you consider custom orthotics or specific shoes when you're having foot pain? All right, thanks for the question, Rachel. This is a common question that we get in the clinic uh, pretty much on a daily basis. I think there, there are multiple reasons why we order an orthotic, uh, otherwise known as an insert for your shoe. Uh, one of the most common reason is to correct a painful, a painful flexible deformity. Um, so one of the classic example is a flat foot deformity where patients have pain either on the inside or the outside of the ankle, uh, which is related to the position of the foot in space. And so with, as long as the deformity is flexible, uh, you can essentially design a, a, an insert to correct the foot so as to change the position of the, uh, the foot uh, in relation to the ground. So a flexible uh, deformity that is causing pain is a pretty straightforward indication for a custom orthotic. Great. Thank you so, so much for that insight. So I know that foot pain can be all-consuming and some, uh, sometimes because we need them to do everyday basic activities. Plus, we walk all over them. I know our viewers will appreciate hearing that from your perspective. So just a reminder to our viewers, if you have a question for the panel, please add it to the live stream chat below, and we'll tackle those at the end. Now we're going to take it to Rachel in the anatomy corner. Welcome back to the anatomy corner. Let's take a look at some foot and ankle anatomy. 
Now the foot and ankle is really a complex anatomical area of the body because there are so many bones and ligaments that make up these structures. Now the ankle joint itself is formed between the tibia or the shin bone and the talus, which is a foot bone, and they articulate like so. The movement of your tibia on the talus is the movement of your ankle. Now there's one more bone associated with the ankle, and that's the fibula. And this bone articulates just like so on the leg, and the fibula is actually on the outside of the leg. And the fibula functions as muscle attachments within the leg that help move the ankle joint. Now usually when someone breaks an ankle, they're usually breaking this part of the tibia and this part of the fibula. It's called a malleolar break. Every once in a while, someone can also break the back side of the tibia. So really when you're breaking your ankle, you're breaking the bones in your leg, not necessarily the bones in your ankle. And as you can see on this specimen, you can see the vast number of ligaments that hold all the bones together in the foot. And there's lots of space there where the bones articulate with each other. And you can see that again here in the toes. So there's ample opportunity for bones to rub against each other and for arthritis to occur in the foot. You can also imagine how difficult it might be to perform surgery in this area because of the vast number of ligaments and how encased these bones are in those ligaments. The Achilles tendon is a very thick tendon that attaches to the back of the heel on the calcaneus bone. And it attaches to the calf muscles, both the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle. And these muscles are very important, strong muscles for extending or plantar flexing your foot. Now when this ruptures, it usually makes a really loud popping sound that sort of sounds like a shotgun going off. So it can be quite startling to rupture this tendon. Now on the other side of the calcaneus, on the inferior side or the ground side, you'll find something called the plantar fascia. And this also attaches to the calcaneus. And the calcaneus is the bone that hits when we walk. It's our heel, it's our heel strike bone. So you can imagine it gets a lot of forces put on it just from our everyday activities, sports, and recreating outside. Now the plantar fascia holds the arch of the foot together and holds these muscles in that um, help us manipulate the arch of our foot. Now many of us might have weak arches and we might have to strengthen the muscles that help maintain our arch. And it's really important to do that because if your foot collapses downward or inward, it can cause misalignment in the ankle, misalignment in the knee, and that can travel all the way back up to the hip. So ankle stability is really important for a healthy functioning body. Now that we've looked at some of the foot and ankle anatomy, let's hear from Dr. Biggerstaff about some of the surgical interventions that can be performed when we injure this area of the body. Hi, my name is Scott Biggerstaff. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with Ortho Carolina. My practice is located in Winston-Salem. I have a particular interest in minimally invasive surgery. However, I do specialize in all areas of, of foot and ankle surgery, from arthritis to athletic injuries to heel pain, from probably five years old all the way up to patients in their 90s. Ankle sprains are probably one of the most common injuries that we see in our office as orthopedists. You can see on this model right here that there are two main sets of ligaments that get injured when you have an ankle sprain. One is called your calcaneofibular ligament, and then you also have your anterior talofibular ligament that's right here. With an ankle sprain, when you hear about a tear, they kind of just stretch out like this. Once the ligaments are stretched out, it's very easy for the bones to go out of alignment. If it happens chronically, that actually can lead to arthritis. One of the most common thing that I see every day is heel pain. There's many causes of heel pain. Uh, probably the three most common, one would be stress fractures. The second would be Achilles tendonitis. And then the third thing would be plantar fasciitis. Stress fractures in general are treated with immobilization. A lot of times we'll put people in walking boots, modify their activities and they get better. The second thing is Achilles tendonitis. 
So the tendonitis would be an inflammation of the Achilles. You just get this really painful swollen area. This ligament right here is called your plantar fascia. And where most people get the pain is right here where it attaches to the bone. And what causes the pain is that people get micro tears in this area and that's actually what causes the pain. As you can see right here, we have an example of a patient with a bunion. And what happens with a bunion is you get these metatarsal bones that deviate apart. The big toe kind of goes towards the outside of the foot and that's what creates the deformity here. This area right here where the bunion's located, the patient gets pain, irritation, swelling, redness from where it presses on their shoes. In the last several years, there's been a shift in foot and ankle surgery from doing things with a big open incision to doing it minimally invasively. I've got a couple of cadaver specimens here. I'm just making an incision that shows the approximate size of a, a traditional bunion surgery. And as you can see here, depending on the severity of the bunion, I mean, you can have an incision that may be one and a half, two inches long. Currently, with the minimally invasive surgery, and I have a second specimen here, I make a, a small incision that is you know, not even a, a centimeter long. That's actually where I use these specialized instruments to help you know, correct the bunion. And then after that, I fix the bunion with, in general, three screws. And to place those screws, I have two additional little small incisions here, and then I have the final incision for the, the third screw that would be up in this area. As you can see, there's a significant difference between these two specimens in the size of the incision. I'm constantly looking ways to improve the patient experience. Traditional bunion surgery, I always felt like it was a long recovery and was difficult for the patient. However, when I started doing the minimally invasive bunion surgeries, I was blown away as to the patient experience. They had less pain, I had them walking sooner, and I was able to get them in regular shoes sooner than I would have been doing it the more traditional way. Many of my patients have come back to me and said that they wish they had done it sooner because it was a better experience than what they had heard from family members and friends who had had bunions fixed previously. Another common area that interests me and also that we see a lot of injuries and chronic conditions to are the Achilles tendon. This is the Achilles tendon right here. It's actually the tendon that attaches your calf to your heel bone. One of the other common injuries that we get are Achilles tendon ruptures. The physical exam test that we use to diagnose the Achilles tendon rupture is called a Thompson's test. And basically what I do is I squeeze the calf and that puts pressure on the Achilles tendon. You can actually see the foot kind of pushing down. As you can see here, I just made an incision and what I'm doing is to show you what the Achilles tendon looks like uh, when the patient has a negative Thompson's test or when the Achilles tendon is intact. And you can see here when I squeeze the leg, um, you can see the, the tendon moving here and then uh, thereby moving the heel and the rest of the foot. People will say, you know, how do I know when I've had an Achilles tendon rupture? What are my symptoms? They'll feel a loud pop, um, and a lot of pain in the back of their ankle. And frequently what I hear is that the patients will turn around and look to see who kicked them in the back of their leg. Now that we've got the Achilles tendon exposed, I'm actually going to surgically create an Achilles tendon rupture and then we can show you what a positive Thompson's test looks like. And you can see when I squeeze the calf now um, that you know there's very little uh, movement or flexion down. This would be a good example of an open Achilles tendon repair. We do a similar thing when I do it minimally invasively but you end up putting stitches kind of in the upper end and lower end and then tying them together.
Well, I've now reconnected the ends, and so when I squeeze the calf, the foot will uh, plantar flex or, or push down like it did earlier. The recovery can take six to nine months. Typically, I keep them non-weight bearing or keep them not walking on that particular foot for about four to six weeks. Once we allow the Achilles tendon ruptures to start walking after their surgery, we begin physical therapy. Sometimes they'll stay in physical therapy for several months. I always stress to them afterwards to continue with the therapy uh, until they feel like they're back to normal and sometimes that can take nine to 12 months. Thanks for watching our demonstration. If you experience any foot and ankle problems or injuries, we would be happy to see you at any of our Ortho Carolina locations. Please feel free to visit us online to schedule an appointment. Rachel, I always get so excited when we see these behind the scenes segments. We actually get a chance to really feel like we're in the OR with the surgeon. I know we covered a lot there, but hopefully that inspired you with some questions. Um, as we've learned so far, the foot and ankle makeup is very complex and can be fragile, so it's comforting knowing what your appointment may actually look like. Yes, it absolutely is. And because we're able to facilitate these lab opportunities, it gives the viewer a real depiction of what these procedures could look like and provides you with a comprehensive level of education before your appointment. I totally agree. Now, Dr. Ford, I want to throw you a question here. Um, can plantar fasciitis go away on its own? And how do you know if you need to be treated for that? Great question. Plantar fasciitis is a common problem. The short answer to that is that yes, it can go away on its own, but plantar fasciitis usually comes on for a, can for a variety of reasons. Um, plantar fasciitis usually shows up as sort of an aching pain that's worse in the morning, worse when you walk on hard floors, it's really in the bottom of the center of the heel. And usually stretching the calf and wearing some good cushion in the back of the shoe can really help. Um, if you have symptoms for a course of months and months, those interventions typically intervene and help help make the symptoms go away. Um, occasionally we have to do other things, but tip, it, but it certainly can go away on its own. And I think you covered this, but how do you know if you need to be treated? It, it's just if it's in pain for quite some time? In most of the time, we advise people to come see us if they have foot and ankle pain that interferes with their normal activities or bothers them on a daily basis. So if if your symptoms are bad enough that you can't do what you want to do or it the, the pain you have interferes with your quality of life, then it's typically reasonable to come in and see us, whether it's pain in the bottom of your heel or somewhere else in the foot or ankle. Okay, great. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, Dr. Sean. Um, I'll throw this next question to you. Uh, for our athletes and weekend warriors out there, what is the recovery like for an ankle fracture or sprain? Is there any way that one can prevent an ankle sprain or fracture by stretching or doing certain exercises? Well, this is a, a bit of a complicated question because sprains and fractures are, are different and act differently. And then you also have to take into account how old the patient is. Uh, people with a minor sprain that are younger get back by two weeks. Somebody that has an older, uh, you know, older patient, such as myself, uh, it may take six months for a more severe sprain for me to get better. And it's the same for ankle fracture. So a fracture is a, a break of the bone. So the bones around the ankle are either your tibia or your fibula. And usually the bone that's broke is the one on the outside called the fibula. And you can have a minor break that can get better within six to uh, 12 weeks, but you have, may have major breaks that take a year to get better. So a lot of variability there as far as uh, what happens uh, before I can tell you how, how long you're gonna be out. Thank you for that insight. I can totally understand that it all depends um, and we're just realizing that. So um, if you're just now tuning in, you're watching Ortho Carolina's sixth orthopedic anatomy event, exploring your body from the inside out, foot and ankle edition with Experience Anatomy. So this year we've covered in-depth topics when it comes to shoulder injuries, spine ailments and treatments, hip and knee pain, hand, wrist and elbow care, sports injuries, and today we're tackling common foot and ankle ailments with a few of our experts. So thank you guys for being here. 
Yeah, so it's really cool to get a behind the scenes look at this amazing work that you do at Ortho Carolina. Folks, if you would like this type of content, Ortho Carolina has live streamed a few smaller procedures in the OR and will hopefully have more to come. If you can check out these videos on Ortho you can check out these videos on Ortho Carolina's Facebook page. Now, just a reminder, if you're watching live, please submit your questions below. We're going to move into our Ask a Doctor segment to get all of your burning foot and ankle injury related questions answered by our awesome panel. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Keep in mind, these are questions sent in by audience members live and ahead of time. If you missed your chance to ask a question, we will recap this episode and provide as many follow-up answers as possible post today. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Bigger's staff for the first question. Elena? Okay, so I'll throw this one to you. So we've got a listener um, or a watcher saying he has severe pain in their feet um, and they get hot, sharp pains, sometimes in their toes and sometimes in the ball of the foot and sometimes both. It could either be both feet and it comes and goes. Is that symptoms of arthritis or maybe some other problem? And do you have any insights on that? It seems like a lot is going on there. Yeah, so great question. I would agree. Um, I see patients like this fairly frequently. Um, you know, when you start talking about both feet, um, you have to start thinking a little bit outside the box instead of, you know, just is it a tendon or a ligament? Uh, more likely, it's probably going to be arthritis. One of the things that concerns me a little bit, you know, when they talk about the burning pain, you know, that possibly could be nerve related. Um, so the best thing to do would be to come in to see one of our foot and ankle orthopedists and have us evaluate you. Um, if we think that it's more nerve related, a lot of times I'll get the neurologist involved to you know, help take care of the patients. Um, actually, one of the common things that we see is something called neuropathy, which is an inflammation of the nerves. Um, unfortunately, as foot and ankle orthopedists, we don't really treat neuropathy a lot. And so we get the medical doctors and neurologists involved on that. Wonderful, thank you so much for that answer. Um, we have a burning topic here. I'm going to toss this to Dr. Irwin, but if anyone else has any input, go ahead and feel free to answer. Um, but what is the difference between a podiatrist and an orthopedist? Thanks. That's that's another great question, um, and we we sort of get that a lot in the clinic. And so, um, the biggest difference is uh, um, from an orthopedic surgery standpoint. You know, we feel that we get trained. First, we go to medical school for four years, then residence, orthopedic surgery residency for five years, where we learn about the entire body of orthopedics and musculoskeletal issues in the entire body. And then for those of us who go into foot and ankle, we then spend an extra year just looking at foot and ankle um, orthopedic surgery in general. And so, um, you know, podiatry, uh, they are trained a little bit differently. They have different... Um, um, boards that they have to go through. And there's a lot of good podiatrists out there. Um, and so it's it's a, just a little bit of a different way to think about fixing the body uh, from a from a overall musculoskeletal standpoint where we're sort of a little bit more based in trauma. And so um, it's just a different a different level of training, a different type of training. So that's about the best answer I can give you for that. Thank you for that answer. I know that's a tough one, but we appreciate you tackling that right up top. Um, I'm going to throw this question to Dr. Pachabi. Um, what is the recommended process for fixing claw toes? Can you give any insight on that? Sure. Uh, again, one of the common condi conditions that we see, so claw toe refers to a deformity of the toe. Uh, and there are a couple of deformities based on where and which joint specifically is affected. Claw toes um, really involve a deformity uh, through multiple joints involving the, the toe itself. Um, typically, by the time patients come to us, they tend to be more rigid than flexible. Uh, and their primary complaint really typically res re revolves around pain over the, uh, over the, the dorsum or the back of the foot. Um, and it's typically related to shoe wear irritation. Um, some patients also complain of pain at the bottom of the foot. I think just like um, Dr. Ford had mentioned, I think the, 
Treating the deformity outside of uh, having pain is really not recommended most of the time, but typically patients come in with pain. So if a patient has a claw toe that is interfering with their life, uh, interfering with shoe wear, for example, and causing significant pain, um, I think it would be a good idea to come and see us. Uh, we typically work these conditions through x-rays, a physical exam. Uh, there are multiple treatments that are available depending on the uh, on the, uh, the severity of the deformity, the flexibility, et cetera. So um, it's, it's a common thing that we see. And uh, depending on what the patient needs, I feel like everyone on this panel here can provide the appropriate care. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll toss this next question to Dr. Ford. Um, what is the recovery for bunion repair? And specifically, how long does someone typically have to wait to be back running? Good question. Um, you know, a lot of people have bunions. Most of the people we see with bunions are women, and it's quite often someone who's active who hasn't had symptoms before, but as they get older and their bunion progresses, they start to become symptomatic, and it interferes with things like running. Um, our interventions for bunions are usually surgical. We don't really have many interventions other than shoe wear changes and activity modifications that really can change your symptoms without something surgical, unfortunately. But if you do undergo a bunion correction, um, the downtime is sort of dependent on how bad your deformity is. Um, we can do things closer to the joint that it, for a less severe bunion and sometimes have to do things further up the foot for a more severe bunion. Um, and occasionally arthritis accompanies a bunion, which can opens up a whole nother list of um, potential considerations. Regardless, under, undergoing a bunion surgery, we're, we typically have people walking only on their heel for, for anywhere from two to six weeks, depending on how bad it is and what technique we use. Um, uh, we've gotten a lot better over the last 15, 20 years in fixing bunions, preventing recurrence, making sure people come away with it, not only a year out, but five years out with persistent pain relief. Um, as far as getting back to running, as soon as the bone heals, which in adults take two, takes two to three months, you can start getting back into your normal activities. It takes a little bit for us to get our strength back. So I would say realistically running, true running would probably be more of a four to six month target, um, but sort of that's person dependent. I think that's awesome for people to kind of get an idea of the timeline. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going to toss this one to Dr. Sean. Um, bear with me. It's a very specific question, but I think it um, might answer a few things for some other people. Um, so this person wrote in saying, I turned my left foot over last night and I thought I might have sprained my ankle. However, my ankle seems fine, but the top left side of my foot is swollen and blue. The area is very painful to touch and to put weight on it actually hurts. Is it possible to fracture a bone on the top of your foot or is this just a bad sprain? Any thoughts? So you definitely can break other bones in your foot, uh, especially, specifically the metatarsals can be broken when you turn your foot that way. Uh, it's, the most common would be a uh, fracture to the base or the most uh, closest to your ankle part of the fifth metatarsal would be the most common injury. The, the biggest thing though that I have to say at this time is if you're having pain when you put weight on it, you do need to come in and be seen and have an x-ray taken, whether it be at a uh, urgent care or you know, in the office, if we can provide appointment quickly enough for you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so the next question I'm gonna send to Dr. Bigger's staff and this one, it seems complicated to me, but I'm not a surgeon. So um, can ankle fusion be reversed? So that's a really good question. Um, I think there are a lot of factors that could go into that decision. Um, in short, I mean, yes, it can be reversed. Um, and occasionally we'll get a patient that comes in that uh, for one reason or another is not happy with their ankle fusion. Um, maybe they had one when they were, maybe they had the fusion done when they were young um, and just, you know, don't like the stiffness, having some pain. Um, and in the appropriate patient, we're actually able to take that uh, fusion and turn it into an ankle replacement. Um, so, I mean, there, there are lots of factors. 
probably also depends on if there are other joints that have been fused in and around the ankle. Um, so, I mean, that's a great question, but, but yes, it can be done. That's so interesting. I love how it's complicated to us, but you guys seem to have it all uh, figured out. So thank you. That's why you guys are here. Um, okay, so I'm going to throw this one to Dr. Irwin. Um, speaking of ankle, or I'm sorry, um, we're going to head back to Achilles. Um, someone asked, what is the difference between a tear and a rupture in that tendon? And is it the same thing? Uh, it's another it's another good question and, and something we hear a lot. Um, it, basically, I would say it's the same. It's the same thing. Um, similar to I was going to say this earlier. Uh, I think Dr. Sean mentioned a break and a fracture. We hear that a lot. Well, you know, well I think I just fractured my bone, but but did I break it or fracture it? And really, that's the same thing. When it comes to the Achilles, I would say a tear and a rupture really is is the same thing. Um, so. Um, and, you know, you can have complete tears uh, or partial tears, complete rupture or partial rupture. Um, so those are there are some differences in terms of whether or not it's a complete Achilles tear. But I would I would say that a tear and a rupture is the same thing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm going to toss the next question to Dr. Bashabi. This person wants to know more about big toe arthritic implants. That's a good question. Um, so arthritis of the big toe is very, very common. Um, and um, it's a very dis disabling uh, simply just because it's, it's, uh, you push off the, uh, that joint specifically to a greater extent in the foot. Um, the, I think the question is referring to fusion of a, um, a very arthritic um, a great toe. And there are many implants that are available. Uh, one of the key things to keep in mind for patients is despite what the implants look like, uh, they serve a purpose. And the purpose is essentially to, um, to bring the two bones together and hold them in place rigidly until one's body is able to heal across it. Uh, and so there are plates available, there are different screws, there are different uh, metal staples. Um, different implants that, that do the job uh, of essentially holding the two bones together until it healed. So uh, from one practice or one physician to another, the implants may look different, uh, but the objective uh, and the desired outcome is the same. Great. Thanks for that answer. So Dr. Ford, I'm going to toss this one to you. Someone reached out saying, when is it time to consider ankle joint replacement? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. That one was for me. Yes, that one was for Dr. Ford. Just confirming I didn't want to talk over someone else. Um, ankle joint replacement is a, a um, technique that we've gotten much better at as a group of orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons over the last 10 to 15 years. Two thirds of patients that come to us with ankle arthritis have had an ankle fracture. So that may, that may be helpful to frame things for you. Really, it's considering ankle brace replacement is similar to other, um, other conditions where you really make the decision whether or not you want surgery and then you consider your surgical options once you've reached that point. Typically, if someone's young or um, has bad bone stock or has a bad deformity, we may not recommend replacement, but we're much better at doing replacements than we used to be, as I said. Um, the decision to move forward with considering a replacement it really is all about your activity your health otherwise, what you want your daily life to be, and what what can you not do that you used to be able to that frustrates you. If, if there are things that your ankle arthritis prevents you from doing, the, all five of us on this panel can 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 help you with that problem. Um, uh, you, we would just recommend you come talk to us so we can talk you through the options. Um, Interesting. Great. Thank you so much. So this question I'm going to ask Dr. Sean. And this person says, one year ago, I had a calcaneo exostosis removed that had torn my fibularis tendon, a grade two tear, in case you were wondering. Do you see this often, and do you think it could grow back? So it sounds like you had a, a perineal tendon tear, and it's the uh, calcaneal exostosis is, is mo most of the time the calcaneal tubercle. 
And there are two tendons that go in that area. One's the peroneus longus and the other is the peroneus bravus. If that tendon was torn at the time that they took that out, in, in my experience, I repair the tendon uh, when I take that out. If you're still having pain at this time, a year later, I'd recommend getting back with your uh, surgeon and that they should potentially look further, uh, maybe with an MRI again, and potentially surgery to repair that tendon. Uh, the tendons don't tend to repair on their, on, the, on their own. They just don't heal on their own. Great, thanks for that answer. Um, I'm gonna th throw this one to Dr. Biggerstaff. Do you see many patients that have to have surgical intervention on both ankles due to overuse or even multiple injuries to the ankles? And also after surgery, are you more or less, more or less susceptible to re-injure the ankle after surgical intervention? It's a two-parter. So that's another uh, good question. Um, <laughs> Most of the time, uh, you know, we have patients that have these overuse injuries, and in general, um, they're mostly just on one side. So I would say unless somebody's had a big injury, um, the likelihood that we would have to, you know, let's say repair an Achilles tendon or repair some torn ligaments on both sides would be pretty rare. Um, and so the... And I apologize. What was the second part of that question? Yes, let's see. I, I um, oh, yes. So also the part about after surgical intervention, are you more likely to re-injure it? Um, yes. In a case, you know, let's say, let's take ankle instability, for example. Um, in that situation, after you've had the ligaments reconstructed, um, the idea would it be actually to prevent from re-injuring. Or, or have the patient prevent themselves from re-injuring themselves. So, I mean, I think if the patient's gone through adequate physical therapy afterwards, um, that the likelihood of them being more susceptible to being injured would be less. Very interesting. Yes, and you have to do the PT in order for it to work, right? The catch-22. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this next question is, I went to a foot doctor for a bunion on the side of my foot. I've been wearing an orthotic in my shoes every day for the last two months now. How long does it take for a custom orthotic to work? Dr. Irwin? Yeah, so that's um, my assumption is when they say a bunion on the side of their foot, I'm assuming they're talking about what's called a bunionette or a Taylor's bunion, which is on the outside part of the foot near the fifth metatarsal. Um, and those can be a little tricky because you can have pain from pressure with shoe wear. Uh, you can also have pain on the bottom of that part of the foot. And so I, again, I'm making a, a few assumptions here with the question, but I'm assuming they maybe had surgery for the bunionette um, and now well, the, the person, the, the surgeon is trying to offload the outside part of the foot with an orthotic um, or, you know, an insert in the shoe to, to offload it. So um, with all those assumptions in place, I would say, you know, it can, it can certainly take a while. A while. Orthotics don't necessarily fix things right away. Um, it's also really dependent on how the orthotic is made and is it, is it trying to offload the bottom of the head um, where, where that might be where the pain is. Um, on the flip side, an orthotic can put a little, little more, uh, they're going to be more volume inside the shoe. And so if the, the pain is on the outside part of the foot, it can actually put, you know, more pressure on that area. So a lot of it sort of depends on where the pain is, but I, I would say probably stay the course, give it some time. And, and I mean, the orthotic, it can take a few weeks um, to a, you know, a month or so to kind of get used to the orthotics. Um, if it's been longer than that, then it might not work. You might need to look at other options. Great. Thanks for that answer. I hope that helped to those who asked about that. Um, I'm going to toss this to Dr. Pachabi. Um, someone re uh, wrote in saying they have hammer toes that are flexible. How, are there any exercises that they can do that will help with hammer toes? 
Um, good question. I think um, I think keeping the the toe, you know, there's a big difference between deformities and the the ankle and the foot that are flexible and those that are rigid. Um, so I think as long as the patient can can uh, you know commit to stretching the toe and keeping it flexible, um, I think in the absence of pain over the back of the toe because of the deformity, um, I think it is something that you know can uh, uh, can be doesn't necessarily need to be treated overtly. Um, so I would recommend simply keeping the toe flexible. You can passively move the toe and stretch the uh, uh, the toe. Uh, there is a component of, uh, of dynamic deformity, meaning, uh, you know, a deformity that really presents when a patient is walking. And in that setting, there's really limited, you know, you're really limited uh, in terms of how you can prevent the, the deformity from persisting and potentially becoming rigid in the future. So it sounds like the, the patient is aware of the deformity and I think, you know, stretching doesn't hurt. Um, and I think if there is any pain that develops, I think uh, it may be better sooner rather than later to see uh, one of our surgeons for, uh, for a thorough assessment. Very good. Yeah, good to keep an eye on some of those things to make sure they don't get worse before you can get in to see a doctor. Speaking of, this patient asked, uh, I have a dislocated large toe that can't be fixed without surgery. Is there any harm walking on it until I can see a doctor in January? Dr. Ford? That's an interesting question. Um, it depends on when the dislocation happened. If you dislocated it recently, um, it sounds like you saw a doctor who told you it needed to be fixed with surgery. If it's a long-standing dislocation, waiting until January to be seen is likely okay, but depends on your medical context. Um, if you have a long-standing big toe dislocation, you may have a condition called neuropathy. I would be worried that you might. Um, in that circumstance, you could develop ulceration underneath the, the first metatarsal head where the big toe has elevated or dislocated to, which will lead to more pressure in that area. I'm making assumptions again, as some of us have on these questions, but that can lead to an ulceration, which can be a, become a bad problem quickly. Um, uh, if it were me, I would see someone, see someone sooner than later for a dislocated big toe. Um, because with time, the options can change. Um, if you know it's been dislocated a long time, um, then I suppose it could be okay to wait until January. But Great. Thanks for that insight. I hope that helped. Um, Dr. Sean, can you talk about Charcot-Marie tooth disease? So Charcot-Marie tooth disease is uh, a neurologic disorder. And what happens is the nerves that uh, go from your brain all the way down to the tips of your toes, those become affected and the longest nerves are affected first. And so you start having deformities that occur with your foot where you get a higher arch, you start getting these claw toes and you start having weakness and it, it is because the nerves aren't functioning the way that they should. This is also a hereditary condition. So this is genetic. Uh, this is not something that you caused th that this happened. And so this is something either a spontaneous mutation, meaning that the gene changed in your body alone or you inherited it uh, from your parents. We do see patients with uh, Charcot-Marie tooth, uh, but again, you would have to be seen in order to evaluate how, how bad it is. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so I wanna talk about uh, overpronation. Can it be corrected? And what precautions should be taken when jogging and exercise? Um, who should we toss that to? Dr. Biggerstaff. All right, perfect. Um, I, over, you know, like a lot of the topics we've talked about tonight, um, you know, some of these are you know, pretty broad topics. Um, you could have a patient that has overpronation or you know what we'd also like to think of as a flat foot um, there can be multiple causes it could be congenital um, somebody could have a flexible flat foot that's been there for all their life and doesn't give them a problem and then you also have patients who have uh, flat feet uh, due to tendon disorders or even you know patients who have a flat foot that's rigid and really painful so i mean that's a really you know broad topic um, you know, people who have a flexible flat foot and maybe have a little bit of a pain, little bit of pain, sometimes bracing helps. Um, sometimes orthotics, like we talked about earlier, can also 
help. Um, you know, it's best if you've got a, if, if you're concerned and you have pain and you over pronate, come see one of us, um, you know, especially also if, you know, you use a flat foot, um, you know, that's something that needs to be addressed and treated, you know, prior to getting worse. All right, I'm gonna to toss this to Dr. Irwin. Is there a difference between a heel spur and a bone spur? Um, so bone spurs can happen um, pretty much anywhere in the body. Um, heel spurs are the, what kind of the layman's term for plantar fasciitis. A lot of people come in and say, I have heel spurs. Um, and that to me, to us means plantar fasciitis, which there is a bone spur on the bottom of the foot, um, but it often doesn't really have anything to do with whether the, um, whether or not they have plant plantar fasciitis, which is really more ligament on the bottom of the foot. Uh, so, um, you know, again, but you can have bone spurs, the top of the big toe, if you have arthritis of the big toe, you can have a bone spur there. So. Um, you, know, you can really have bone spurs anywhere, and it typically comes from some arthritis or some prior injury. Yes, very interesting. Thank you very much. So we only have a few questions left. So now is your chance to submit your questions if you want to have them answered tonight. Um, the next question up is going to be for Dr. Bushabi. Um, what could be causing the pain in the ball of my foot at the joint of the second toe? next to the big toe? Uh, good question. Again, common, common uh, complaint in the clinic. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one, that's pretty straightforward. Um, just like any, any joint, uh, you, you can get uh, some inflammation within the joint or also called synovitis, uh, which is a fairly common uh, reason for pain in that location of the foot. Um, the other reason, um, you know, you can have um, every joint has cartilage or cushioning between the two uh, the, the two bones, and you can have injuries to the cartilage that, uh, you know, present themselves in, in, uh, uh, in terms of pain. One of the uh, other reasons uh, can be really unrelated to the foot itself. Um, for patients who uh, have contractures or tightening of the calf musculature, uh, what you can end up having is a situation where your foot, instead of sitting flat on the ground, is tilting ever so slightly down. Uh, causing undue pressure to the bottom of the, um, the second metatarsal. So a couple of reasons, I think, in clinic, it's uh, based on the, the history, uh, the x-rays, and the clinical examination. We can kind of um, um, clarify and, and, for the most part, come to an understanding as to what's driving a lot of the pain. Great. Thanks for that answer. Very interesting. Dr. Ford, this one's for you. Uh, this person has diabetic neuropathy and gout in both feet. Is there any other treatment besides medicine for these problems? Well, first of all, I'm sorry. It's two bad problems to have in both feet. Um, you know, the diabetic neuropathy I'll address first. Um, typically patients with diabetic neuropathy have a burning pain. It can be worse at night. Um, it seems to be worse when they have nothing to occupy their mind, right? Medications help us with that more than anything. Um, usually gabapentin or Lyrica, which are nerve modulator medications can be helpful and, and neurologists and our primary care physicians help us with, with those. Um, there are certain foot and ankle problems we worry about in patients with neuropathy. Um, and if you have neuropathy and you get sudden swelling and redness in your foot, you should come see one of us. Um, the gout is also something that we typically defer to our, uh, our primary care physicians to help us manage. Um, gout happens because crystals deposit from our bloodstream into the lining of our joints, and those crystals are highly inflammatory. So you go from having a big toe, for example, that hurts not at all to suddenly overnight being hot, red, swollen, painful. Um, typically, we can treat those acutely with anti-inflammatories, whether they're store they have steroids in them or not. Um, but over the course of the long term, we go back to our primary care physician colleagues because it's really all about managing the blood levels of the substance called uric acid that 
forms those crystals. If we can lower that blood level, we can make the crystals deposit less frequently and stop the erosive changes in your joint. Um, again, we don't have great surgical answers for either. Um, uh, so that's about all I have for that. Okay, very interesting. I actually learned some new stuff there. So thank you for your thorough explanation. I'll send this next question to Dr. Sean. Uh, could you provide more insight into Morton's neuroma? So Morton's neuroma is inflammation and then what's termed fibrosis, which is thickening, thickening around the nerve as it goes from your foot out into your toes. It's typically in between the third and fourth metatarsal heads, but it can happen in other parts of the foot. And it's typically worse when you're wearing shoes because when you're wearing shoes, as your foot swells inside of the shoe, the bones then push together and that nerve is compressed and then typically gets better out of shoes. We, when you're seen in the office, we normally do what I term a diagnostic and potentially a therapeutic uh, in, injection with some local anesthetic and steroid. And if that provides relief, we may repeat that. But if you have temporary relief, meaning that you only get relief for a few days to a few weeks, then we consider surgery where you take out that nerve and uh, essentially uh, make it better because you no longer have that compression that can occur. That was a great answer. Thanks so much for sharing that. So I've got a pretty specific question. I'm hoping Dr. Biggerstaff, you can maybe help me out. Um, a viewer reached out saying that their ankle has recently started to pop when they walk. There's no pain as of now, and this ankle was actually repaired by open reduction and internal fixation of the fibula approximately 12 years ago. Does this mean anything? So another great question. Um, you know, we frequently get that question about ankles popping. Um, you know, it may or may not be related to the injury and the surgery that they had 12 years ago. Uh, um, a lot of times what can happen if it's associated with the injury, maybe it's a little bit of scar tissue that may be causing the popping. Another possibility is that they have a couple of tendons either rubbing against each other or one of the bones. Um, overall, I wouldn't be overly concerned as long as they're not having any pain. If it starts hurting, then I think that would be an indication to come see one of us. All right, wonderful, thank you very much. So we have one question left, and I'm gonna to toss this to Dr. Irwin. Uh, how effective is a cortisone shot in your feet? Uh, yeah, another another great question. I think um, you can tell from a lot of the answers and things we've discussed uh, today that there's a lot of different problems that we see. There's tendon issues, arthritis issues, Morton's neuroma issues. And so it, it depends on what the issue is that the cortisone is, is being used for, but short answer is it can be very, very effective in particular for arthritis. And, and we use cortisone for two, two main reasons, as Dr. Sean mentioned. One is to, for a therapeutic reason to make the patient feel better. And the second reason sometimes is to figure out where the pain is coming from. Is it a certain joint versus a different joint? If the pain doesn't go away from a cortisone injection, um, maybe the problem is something else and it's not coming from that joint. So uh, it's very variable. I typically tell my patients I, when I give an injection, I'll tell them, I don't know if this is going to work for two days, two weeks, or two months, but it's going to give us another piece of, of information that we can use to help you know treat you effectively. So hopefully that answers the question. That was an awesome answer. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions in the live stream. Uh, we are going to do a full recap with all of these answers. And if you have more questions, obviously, feel free to send them in. We will do our best to answer those. Um, but if you liked what you heard or if you want to check out some of our other episodes, feel free to do that. This is the final episode of season one. So we will be back next year with season two and some more different ailments that we can talk about. So thank you to our panelists, um, and we will see you soon. Thanks so much.
Many thanks to our esteemed panel for sharing their wisdom and insight tonight. And thank you for tuning in to the final episode of the Orthopedic Anatomy series, Exploring Your Body from the Inside Out. If you'd like to learn more about Experience Anatomy, you can find us online at experienceanatomy.com. Have a great night, and we'll see you next year. Bye. Bye.